Shooting it raw? Yes. Shooting it raw. What does photography mean to me? Well, it means capturing moments, whether they are happy moments, sad moments, scary moments. They're just, they're moments um, so that you can go back and re-enjoy them. Even when they're sad or scary, you can still go back and re-enjoy them. Randy Lee, Randy Lee Boson. Thank you for joining me. Uh, slightly different setup behind you this time. So this is your second time on the show. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm moving on up in the world. <laughs> yeah, I, you're you're now living in what looks like a, a purple and black checkerboard chess set. Yes. Yes. Purple is my favorite color. So nice. I, I went uh, with the little checkerboard kind of array. Looks great. Looks great. So I, I, I take it this is your home studio. It is. Yes. Um, my oldest moved out. My mom moved out. And so I snatched the room up and said, it's mine now. Nice. Nice. Uh, just in case, I'm not sure um, there's a wire or something that's rubbing on the microphone because I can hear a little bit of the, is that, because it, it'll, it'll be, yeah. There you go. Great. That's go. it. Easy peasy. Uh, yep. Randy Lee, thank you so much. This is really fun. I mean, it's been a year. So the this time, roughly, uh, well, roughly a year, um, probably a little bit more. Last time we spoke, I was in Toronto and you were in Niagara Falls. Is that it? Close to Niagara Falls. Yeah, about 20 minutes from there. Right, right, right. Okay. And uh, yeah, so now I'm in Hong Kong. So yes. yeah, good evening to you and good morning to me. Right. I know. I told my husband, I was like, oh, yeah, my interviews with somebody in Hong Kong. He goes, oh, so they're in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Yep. When, when the birthday happens, it happens here first. So very nice. Exactly. You could have like one back to back, right? If you're traveling. Exactly. There we go. Randy, I'm I'm curious. I'm excited. Uh, it's been a year. Uh, you look the same except for the hair. The hair this time looks a little different. Yes, I cut it um, and probably <laughs> I've dyed it a bunch of times since then. Um, I don't change much. Like people You're looking from elementary gorgeous. school still recommend. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first photo? Yes. Okay, sure. It's called Vacation. <laughs> uh, oh, yes. <laughs> okay so so um uh let's see so you're wearing these big beautiful sunglasses you're wearing a baseball cap uh yes. it looks like you're on a boat but maybe not uh it looks oh, like oh i wish i was on a boat oh okay or maybe you're it's on oh yeah deck chairs i guess by the side of a pool yes deck chairs yeah. uh big beautiful sky in back blue with these beautiful uh, beginning cumulus clouds. Very nice. Uh, I'd say roughly 11 in the morning, if I'd have to guess. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're yeah, looking... That's a good guess. You're looking nicely tanned in your bathing suit. Yeah. Very nice. Very, very nice. I love it. Um, why start with this one? Vacation. Um, because it is very relaxing. So I was actually in Cuba for that picture. Nice. Uh, and I cannot wait to go back. But it's just... It's a rejuvenating place. It's a relaxing place. It is just a fun way to start because it is a fun place to think about. Oh, wicked. Yeah, it's a good way to set the tone. Yeah, communist. Oh. No, sorry. Did I say that? Sorry. <laughs> Socialist. They're Socialist. Socialists there. Sorry. You're, we're Canadian. We are Canadian. So it's quite, it's fine. It's, it's home. True. Nice. I, I absolutely love Cuba. Everyone there is always so nice. Um, yeah, I don't necessarily agree with their government, but uh, everyone is so nice. The water is always so gorgeous. I have such a great time over there. Wicked. Uh, you know, your these conversations on the podcast uh, are a, a fantastic. I mean, selfishly, they're a great way for me to learn and get influenced by people. And uh, to this day, I totally remember uh, follow your dopamine, chase your dopamine. Um Follow, I'd say yes. follow. So, what, what, so you're following your dopamine, you're chasing follow. your dopamine, yep. yeah. So, following your dopamine, yep. uh, there you are, like, good for you, okay. Yeah, it is a hundred percent my dopamine place, <laughs> mm. okay. So, how do we, um, okay, so it, it's a beautiful way to set the tone, 
Okay. So let's talk about it right now is July. Um, happy Canada Day, by the way. Uh, belated. Oh, Cap- yeah, that happy. was yesterday. Yeah. Um, but uh, you see, I am in the future because it's the third today. Yeah, it was Aha. two days ago for you. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, so, but like vacation. Let's talk about vacation. What is the importance of vacation as an idea? It, to rejuvenate from everything that you have to do and to not think about all the things you need to do. Mm-hmm. And follow your dopamine. Your dopamine, if you don't have dopamine on vacation, you're doing it wrong. Oh, for sure. For sure. So, okay. Uh, let's, so because, since, I mean, listen, have you changed completely that you're no longer writing about mental health? That you're no longer thinking about Oh, no, about I totally health? am. Totally am. So vacation with mental health is, uh, it, it's that rejuvenating part. I yeah. just didn't say for your mental health. But yeah, it's rejuvenating. So um, in fact, I've been thinking about, oh man, I need a vacation because that was in January and now it's been six months and I'm kind of like getting worked up again and like my brain is going on a million miles a minute. So it's like that time to breathe and when I'm on vacation, um, especially in like Cuba, but we're going camping in August. Um, I like to read books. I love mm-hmm. books, but I don't have to think about, you know, what book am I going to read? Does it need to be self development or something like that? I just relax and just pick something random and just not. It's all about the not thinking about what needs done for me to right. do that rejuvenating, to come back and be at the peak game, to then continue talking and writing about mental health. Right. So, okay. So, so um, one of the little things that I like, I like going into surrealist or data is, or just kind of like saying stuff that just doesn't always make sense. And so, um, when people would say to me when I was working and, and other, other moments, people would say to me, Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, the weekend. Yeah. The weekend or, Oh, Saturday or oh, Sunday. And then I would say, I was like, yeah, but they don't exist. Right. Like realistically, Saturday is an idea it's just a day Mm -hmm. and uh it you know it doesn't really exist in the same way that what happens if vacation doesn't exist (gasps) you just broke my heart (laughs) vacation exists but it is it is a concept that we have created a vacation doesn't have to be going somewhere necessarily i like that because then i I don't have to look at my messy house but vacation can is a mindset Mm -hmm. it is it goes back, and I've said it a few times, right? Not thinking about what needs to be done. You can do that while you're at home. Yep. You can just be like, I'm taking – and that's that's a lot of times what meditation is for people, right? They're mm. not thinking about the future. They're not thinking about their to-do list. They're just being in that moment. And that – I mean, in this surrealist sort of conversation, that could be their vacation. For sure. So if, if – for okay, so would you – okay, you're born. You're given a name, right? Uh, me, my name, Ran, means – Joy, happiness, laughter, it's all part of the same soup. Uh, How did your name come about? I have no idea. Oh, really? (laughs) I wasn't told. I I, have no idea. I know my brother's name Mm -hmm. um, was from a soap opera. Okay. I have no idea where mine came from. I do know, however, that when I was first born, my mom spelt Lee, so it might whole first name is randy lee but she spelled lee with l-e-i not mm-hmm. realizing that that actually said lay so mm-hmm. originally for like i don't know three or four days however long it took her to get out of the hospital i was named randy lay okay because she wanted both parts of my name to end in i okay and then when somebody told her that she went oh i can't name her that and went and changed it it would fit in Hong Kong because uh, let's see, like one of one of my girlfriends from way back, uh, her name was like uh, Lee Wen, so L E I dash W N. She was actually mom was from Hong Kong, so so you know it's just how we spell names. So uh, yeah. why am I, where am I going with this? In the sense that if you could choose a name for yourself, like for myself. If I ever thought of, you know, sometimes I like to kind of give myself a nickname. So one of the nicknames, uh, for, which I think makes sense in Cuba. Uh, so did you hear the word pendejo? No. Okay, so well, pendejo. I might have heard it, but I... 
Yes, yeah, so pendejo in, 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 in Cuba, in, in the, it means it means like uh, it's like the crotch area. It means you dick, you asshole. It's I think it literally means pubic hair. So what they do it is it's you. <laughs> Good, you're laughing. Yeah, I definitely don't think I've heard that one. <laughs> so I so the nickname I give myself is rendejo instead of pendejo. So rendejo. Um, but uh, another one is holiday. Like I give myself that that I like that name holiday. Uh, so this is now we're getting back to the point. So yeah. vacation, holiday. What about this notion of giving yourself a holiday as a, as a release valve? And that's just really a, a state of mind. Yeah, well, I, exactly. And that's, it all kind of goes together. Having that rejuvenating, not thinking about the future. And that's why I said, you know, for, it could be something as simple as like a meditation for 10 minutes to reset yourself and your mindset. Mm -hmm. because let's be real not all of us are lucky enough to be able to travel um even those of us that are lucky enough to travel can't do it as much as we would like all the Mm -hmm. time Mm -hmm. so we can't only set our standards on this idea of a vacation that is a plane ride away because we're going to be awfully disappointed when we can't do it as frequently Mm -hmm. as we want like with the pandemic Um, yes um (laughs) you remember that thing Mm -hmm. how can i forget actually (laughs) The pandemic wasn't horrible for me, other than the fact that we couldn't travel. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't mind staying home. (laughs) Okay. Okay. But, um, oh, I was just going to say, but like, so with this mindset of resetting and um, that just even yesterday and yeah, it was a holiday. We didn't do anything holiday-y, but we took our one dog down to the outlet mall because the outlet mall is all dog friendly just to get out of the house and to get him kind of some exercise and get him used to going to places. And it was very rejuvenating, very refreshing in my mind. No, I don't really call it a vacation, but in all reality, I had that vacation feeling of just total relaxation. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's also, since we're talking about mental health and, um, you know, anxiety being really, I mean, the, the it's, it's, people are very aware of this now is that anxiety is kind of just really being overcome and worried about the future, right? Be it tomorrow yeah. or next week or next month or next year. And in a way, the vacation or the holiday is about saying, you know what, I'm present. I'm not, I don't need to sweat. I'm not, you know, I don't need to worry about, you know, because for the next week, you know, like here, this photo of you in, in Cuba. Uh, how long did you go for? A week. A week. Very well. And you all, you always stayed in the same sort of spot or you kind of traveled around? Um. Well, the first time we stayed in Cayo Keo- de Guillermo and then last time we stayed in Cayo Coco. Um, I think we're probably going to stay in Cayo Coco again. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, least, look, was beautiful nice sky. Day. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So, so let's say for, for a listener, um, and we want to inspire them somehow, how do we inspire them? I mean, other than give yourself a holiday, give yourself a vacation. Like, how, what, what can we say in terms of... Uh, that's what I was going to say. Um, don't set your standard that a vacation has to be X, Y, Z. Like, it, it doesn't have to be on a plane to an island or heck if you like to go travel to Hong Kong or whatever it doesn't have to be something that's going to cost a lot of money um so give yourself a break in thinking about what it is and just enjoy the here and now and what you can do right now here here uh and look <clears throat> as you're saying this I'm super present to the fact that for whatever reason however fate decided We've crossed paths. We met a year ago-ish. And here we are again. And nice to see you. Nice to see you again. Nice to meet you again for the second time. This is great. Right? I know. It's, I love being a repeat guest on shows because you have such a great rapport with them. Like you developed the rapport in the first one. Mm-hmm. And so then the second time is just so easy. Sure. You've already done it. Yep. Well, let's move on to the next photo then. Uh, photo two. <clears throat> okay, so it's a it's it's called together. You're seated with uh oh you're you're into the the, the square frame. So um you're where you have these really nice square frame glasses. Very dark lipstick, almost crimson. Uh, your hair is um waved. You're wearing a a, a black shirt with a very nice necklace. Uh, black shirt with these, I guess these um. 
things that catch the light. I don't know. There's a there's a young man seated on your right who's looking at the camera because you're doing a sort of selfie of the both of you together. Yep. That would be my husband. That's your husband, handsome fellow. Yeah. Uh, looking at the camera going like, this is the face of, okay, fine, I'll participate with this selfie. Sure. <laughs> Good, do, you do your thing. <laughs> semi-formal, semi-formal. It's nice because the, the color tone of the, like just aesthetically, right? So you're inside of a, a kind of a, a it could be a conference hall or a meeting room yeah. or something. And, and we are. It was a Christmas party, his work's Christmas party. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's all very nice. It's a very nice sort of portrait, self-portrait. Uh, so uh, together, what are we talking about? Randy Lee. Um, we're talking about, so actually we just had our 11-year wedding anniversary last week. Oh, sweet. Um, and that's what it's talking about. It's talking about togetherness. Um I was I was trying to find a picture of like the two of us plus the kids, the grandkid, but I just I didn't have one of everybody mm -hmm. um, together. So I just thought that one was really it looked so nice. It was very appealing. Mm -hmm. um, but just that fact of being together, like when to tie this back into the first one too, when we're on vacation, or even like I said yesterday was just sort of a relaxed vacation mindset sort of a day. I'm usually with my husband. I. Don't tell him. I enjoy spending time with him. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, I got right? it. Right, like I uh, after eleven years together, well, sixteen together. Right. But after eleven years of marriage, we still like hanging out together, and I think that is so important to find that person, whether it be a best friend, a husband, that you look forward to spending time with, because mm -hmm. that will also keep you present in the moment and not worried about what needs to be done or worried about what has already transpired because you can just be with them in the moment and enjoy what you've got. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in terms of this question of companionship, in terms of togetherness, so let's say you're born and in your family, you're, you're within a sort of family union, unit. And from the training that I do, we like to say that this is the you know, if you're born into a family, and most people are, that's your first experience of being in a in a network, right? What we call a service yep. network, right? And so, right now, your service network, uh, you have two kids. How many how many kids? Two kids and a grandson. Two kids and a grandson. So it's a small little network, right? Some people have like fourteen yep. kids, right? So it's just like Oof. bonkers. Yeah. Okay, so so how do you how would you Talk about this notion of, of, of unity and, and togetherness as, as a support system. Mm. Um, first off, I would say it takes work. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because even if you love your spouse, which I hope you do. Sure. Um, even if you birthed your kids or you didn't and they're stepkids, but you love them, it's still work, right? Mm -hmm. And... I think it's a little easier with the grandson because, well, he's so little and there are no rules with Grammy. Um, but, right, right, right. But it is work. Relationships are work. So as much as it can be a great companionship and a wonderful network, you still have to give respect and receive respect from them mm -hmm. in order for it to be a healthy kind of network because mm -hmm. it's, it's really easy to be in a family like you said be born into a family and not have a healthy sure network and been there done that had a, you know some some rough times growing up but when i chose my spouse when i don't really choose my kids but when we raised and chose the rules and chose mm -hmm. the discipline for them not that it was always easy sure <laughs> but we had more control over it than being born into that family so I think choosing your network, if we're, if we're going to use that word, choosing those people that we want to be around, we can be selective and that can be difficult at times, especially if our mental health is in a poor place. Mm. Um, and, you know, sometimes people use others or you think that, you know, you want to be a people pleaser just so people like you um, or you're too anxious or whatever it might be. It, it's not always easy to choose the right people, but we have the opportunity to do so. And we also have the opportunity that if we choose the wrong person, we don't have to stay there with them right. forever. Whether, like I said, it's your friend or your spouse 
or this is going to sound horrible, or even your child. Sure. Um, I had this talk with my mom lots of times about my brother, and it's unfortunate that he died, but ultimately, while he was alive, we had to make some very tough decisions because of how he chose to be. Now, mm. he was an adult by the time we made those tough decisions. Oh, it wasn't wow. like he was two. Um, but, but you know, even with your kids, you sometimes have to make tough decisions to lay down boundaries. Mm. Um, so no matter what relationship we're talking about, I think that we can choose to be in healthy ones and we can choose to walk away from unhealthy ones. I'm not saying it's easy. Mm-hmm, just mm-hmm. saying that we have the opportunity if we – can get our mindset right in order to do so. Sure. Uh, as somebody who sits at a desk to write, to put together a book, it's it's the world of ideas. It's the world of a narrative. It's a world of setting out a direction, you know, where you're also projecting yourself as a reader who's going to kind of interact uh, with the with the text. To to and in in your sense, you want you're trying to convey. A message of sorts, you know, and you've done a lot of the personal work of sitting there dissecting ideas, but trying to go deeper into some ideas to kind of say something different or something new or something Mm -hmm. specific about your experience. So what about having grown up and, and gone through your experiences? What would you say gave you those lessons that that really kind of because uh, you you mentioned your brother uh, who mm-hmm. isn't with us anymore, but it's just so like if we're all fellow travelers sharing a kind of a ride together, and some people stay on this ride longer than others. So what what when you're sitting there thinking about writing or think, thinking about what to write about? What the what the, the what is the experience of of your brother of your family unit of all of that? How does that inform what you what you write about? Um, well, it's definitely informed the last few books that I wrote. Mm-hmm. Um, so the last one that just released last month was completely about my brother. Um, wow. Okay. 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 So, I th- what I try to do when I'm writing any of the books is pick one topic to stick with it because as much as I write about mental health, it Mm. is a really big, broad area to talk about. I can't write just one book and cover everything. Oh, for sure. For sure. Um, Because it would be really long and – or it would either be really long or it would gloss over a lot of stuff. Oh, for sure. Because you couldn't dig deep. Um, So with that last one, I focused just on, on my brother and experiences related to loving somebody with an addiction. Mm. And before that, I focused on, you know, just depression. Before that, I focused on just being a parent of a child with autism. So my family, my life experiences really decide kind of what topic I'm going to focus on Mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. that moment. And then I just kind of focus everything into that one kind of sphere. And as I'm writing, what usually happens as I'm writing something, go, oh, this would be great. And I'm like, but it really has nothing to do with this particular topic in this particular book. And then so I've already got my next book started. <laughs> so with somebody listening, there, there are a couple of things that that pop up. Right? This is interesting. Like um, somebody listening to the tone of your voice, because if, if it's pure, because it is a podcast, so it's it's all audio. So it's like the war- so the warmth and how you speak, the pace, the in your case, the brightness you know, you're a very bright person and you're a very, you know, you're easy to laugh, easy to smile, talking about vacation, light, it's very lighthearted. And yet, well, you know, the last book I wrote on depression and then the, <laughs> and the other book I wrote about on, on you know, on, on, you know, the most recent one about on addiction. Now, don't leave us hanging. What's the title of your book, please? So it's called Goodbye Too Soon. So it's not just about addiction. Um, My brother actually died two years ago because of his addiction. And I wanted to, when he died, I kept going, well, his death can't mean nothing. And it was just like this thing that went over and over in my head. So I was like, well, I'm an author. Why don't I just write a book about it? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So that's what I did. So it will keep his memory alive and help. The, The one thing about my brother, as much as he couldn't help himself, he always wanted to help other people. Like I remember this one time I was... I don't know, like 14 or 15, like maybe um, probably a little bit younger even. Anyways, I was a teenager 
He's four years older than me. I remember him coming home um, without shoes on because he had given them to somebody who didn't have any because he had another pair at home. Like he was just so caring. He just really could not fight those demons that he had. And Mm -hmm. so I thought, you know what? He would want other people to be in a better place than he was Mm -hmm. because he always wanted that. He just couldn't, couldn't quite get there. Goodbye too soon. A uh, very powerful title. Uh, what is it, the book? So the book is published. It's out now. Yes, it is out. It came out on May 20th, which was the two-year anniversary of his death. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. What's what's your brother's name? Brandon. Brandon. Okay. Um, okay. It's, it's a, you're like, I think this happened the last <laughs> time we spoke where I have this Probably. like. Probably. This is like what's it what's it called? It's like a short circuit or a blown fuse where we're talking and I you know your the sound of your voice, the brightness of your face, of your smile, of you know it's it's there and and I listen. It's not that I'm 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 distraught by it, but I'm 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 intrigued by the fact that my tone doesn't match the topic. No, but it's not that. It's like I find that that the artist is the person who will go where people would tend not to go. So in the previous uh, episode, yes. in the previous episode, um, the guest uh, all, was looking at PTSD and looked at anxiety and different things like that. And she had asked me about or she had mentioned something about um, vulnerability and how it's really tough to become vulnerable. And mm-hmm. in a way... What you do by writing about these very profound topics is that you're sharing your own sense of vulnerability in in the face of a difficult topic. So uh, imagine there's a question in all that. (laughs) Okay, I totally can. Um, So what I feel that you're trying to kind of ask, but don't quite have the words to form it into a question, uh, is... It's been therapy. Like I Mm -hmm. have taken a long time to get to the point I'm at where I can laugh and say, oh, yeah, I have depression. Ha ha ha. Mm -hmm. Right. But not not like laughing in a mean way, but like just be like it is a part of who I am. But it's not everything who I am. Exactly. So it's taken a long time to own it. And that's the same with my brother's death is that I mean, by the time he died, I had already been through quite a bit of therapy. So I owned it a little bit sooner, Um, but I still went back and and talked about his death a little bit more as well. And not just his death, but his life. Mm -hmm. And I think that was really what helped me get to the final draft of this, because I'll admit the first draft of this. Oh, I was angry at him. I Mm -hmm. was so Mm -hmm. angry at him. Yeah. Um, And in the book, I even explain how when we were burying him, I yelled at him a little bit. Mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. Um, But through talking to other people and talking to my therapist I mean with my therapist it was just because certain things have happened to you in your life does not mean that they have to define you yeah they do not have to continue to traumatize you they do not have to continue to control your emotions your thoughts um there's still triggers every once Mm. in a while um but they're a lot less And I notice them now. I'm like, ooh, that's why that's happening. So owning that has made me realize that other people are probably in the same predicament I have been in. And the the best thing for me was learning that I can own it and doesn't have to define me and I don't have to hide it and that other people have it too. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to be scared of it. And I think that's where my vulnerability really comes from. And because I can be that open person, um, I think it's important that I am. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and as you say this, the photo together of you with your with your husband. Um, yeah. Well, so much to, to chew uh, on. Shall we go <laughs> to the next photo? Sure. It's your show. Go ahead. <laughs> uh photo three. Oh, look at this dogs dogs <laughs> uh, cutely enough in the previous episode i mean it was surrounded by dogs dogs uh one of her images was of of rescues uh her dog her was one rescue uh on the sofa and here it's two two photos 
no, sorry, two dogs. Uh, so your, your sofa is uh, like my sofa. It has dog hair on it. Uh, it's that mm-hmm. same. It's the same kind of textured sofa. It's a very dog friendly texture. Uh, it's like rough corduroy almost. Uh, there's a blanket on the left. Yours, your your sofa is like uh, charcoalish. Um, there is one large. Looks like a um, what's it called? Uh, Labrador, I guess. Black. Yep. Dog. Black lab. And then yes. draped. Over <laughs> him or her is this other dog that looks like a mix of German Shepherd or something else. Yep. Beautiful eyes, beautiful coloring, tan with white and black and floppy ears. And they're yeah, both. That's what everyone says. Of course. <laughs> Your babies <laughs> have floppy ears. ears. <laughs> I'm just describing what I see. And uh, I so, yeah, it's, a, it's like a moment of these two dogs. There's no humans in it. It's just two dogs on the sofa. Just kind of companionship. You know what? It's sort of like your together photo, only this is slightly yes. different. Okay. With my doggos. Yes. Yeah. So take it away. I couldn't find a picture. So I actually have three dogs. I couldn't find a picture of all three of them together. Well, there was some, but they weren't just, They weren't that good. This one was uh-huh. just like so sweet. I was like, everyone yeah. needs to see this picture. It's amazing. <laughs> um <laughs> I also have four cats, but there are, you only want three pictures, so I had to pick and choose. No I started problem. with seven, and I had to narrow it down. Seven photos or seven animals? Seven pictures. Okay, yeah, okay. I started with seven pictures, and I had to narrow it down to the three. Nice. Um, but so these two guys here, so Freddie is the black lab. He is 11 years old. Um, we've had him for... Five years, almost six now. Oh, wow. Okay. And he is actually, he's actually my youngest service dog. Okay. Um, and he was a rescue too from America. <laughs> mm-hmm. he, he came, we, we like to joke that he's actually American. Yep. And uh, Zen, Zen is the dog on top. He is a year and a half now. So I nice. thought picture is probably only just a year. Um and he's just a big sucky baby. He yeah, loves his suck. he loves his doggy siblings. He always has to lay like right beside me. He loves his mummy. And uh, he's the one that we took to the mall yesterday. <laughs> okay. Nice. <laughs> to get him more acquainted. Um, because we got him in hopes to train him to take over for Freddy, since Freddy is getting quite old. When you um, say take over, take over and service dog, what do you mean? Yes. So my youngest, uh, he's 16 now, but he does have autism. And so he got a service dog. I guess he would have been 11 at the time when we got him. Uh. And it's really to help with the biggest thing is help with the anxiety and panic attacks that happen, especially when we go out to very busy places. Right. Um, and so with Freddie being 11 years old now, he would like to retire and do nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, he acts like an old stubborn man now. And so the idea is to train Zen to take over. Whether or not that's going to work, we'll we'll see. We're going to keep keep doing. Like he's a really good dog. Um, he's very sweet. You can lay on him like you can lay on Freddie, and he. But he's still very puppyish, right? So yeah, we're course. waiting he's to young. see. Yeah. So we're waiting to see if he he calms down a bit because they do have to get a little bit more calm. Which mm-hmm. is why Freddie didn't Freddie didn't start working until he was. Um, probably around five. Yeah, that's yeah, that's what I would have guessed. Yeah. Okay. They go through extensive training. Yeah. Right. So, what what is that training like? I mean, is it you're doing it at home, or it's done with a trainer? This time around, we are attempting to do most of it at home with Freddie. We got him from a trainer that is um, out in Londonish, Ontario. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were working with her, and like we had to pay her monthly to say like yeah, sure. we are still getting this dog, um, and he was being trained by her i think it was took about three years by from when we said like signed the contract and then by the time we actually got him yeah um and so like i said so it's still just very puppy as she's learning his you know sits and stays still really doesn't like his downs (laughs) (laughs) he's very stubborn when you try to tell him to lay down so we'll Mm. see but um you don't have to. What we've learned over the years is you don't have to have them trained by an organization or a company. You can train them by yourself. They still have to abide by the standards that are set out. Like you would still have to pass his public access test. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't have to be trained by anyone in particular as long as they can pass that public access right. test. So let us welcome us, like let us into your world because um, people who don't have 
this as their experience. I mean, this is your life. So this is, you know, it's, it's just, it's part of just it's what I do. What is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, for example, um, we took our, our, this weekend, we took our daughter and her friend to Ocean Park here in Hong Kong and then this water world thing and lots and lots of noise, lots and lots of thrills. And if you're, you know, follow your dopamine sort of thing. I mean, this was like full on fight or flight adrenaline rush, right? But in there, there's dopamine like crazy. And yeah. um, and at the end of the two days, both girls were 11. I mean, their brains were fried. Like my brain was mm-hmm. fried and their brains was really severely fried. Like in the sense that I could yeah. see like the the stimulus on them was so way above the normal that I could, mm-hmm. you know, really uh, perceive how um, distressing it was, you know. And at the end, they both just needed to, to like, in their separate houses, you know. Her yeah. friend went back to her place and Cadence was here. Just needed to have their quiet time in a dark room to just sort of, like, come down from this insane yeah. weekend. Okay, so that's my experience. So welcome us into your world where you need to have these service dogs. So... It- I mean, it's a similar experience, I'm going to say, but like take two days and make that like 20 minutes. <laughs> okay. um, that's probably the, the easiest way to explain it to understand, right? So the your daughter and her friend, they had all of this fun for two days, whereas my kid, not to say that we haven't gone to places, but we maybe like every 20 minutes are taking a break, like a good yeah. sit down away from the crowd. Um, a lot of times he'll, he'll actually sit like, not on Freddy, but like kind of drape himself over Freddy mm. when you like mm. s- snuggle your doggy. Um, and so there's more breaks. And yeah. depending on where it is, um, I mean, now that he's 16, it's gotten a lot better. He understands his triggers more right, and right. Has, has better coping strategies. But an example from when he was, say, 11 mm-hmm. um, and, and under, I remember this one time, I think he was a little bit younger than 11, maybe nine at the time, but we were at a basketball game and we had been to them in the past, but this one was particularly busy. Yeah. It was at um, the University of Buffalo, I believe. We were at one of their basketball games and it was particularly busy. And every time the buzzer went off, yeah. he was just freaking out oh and for sure running out of the gymnasium and we had to chase him and this wasn't the first time that we had been at one of these games it's mm-hmm. just that this one was particularly busy it was other times that we had went there was you know a little bit more empty space so a lot less chatter yeah there was still the buzzer but there was a lot less chatter so this time with everything combined on top of each other um it was just too much oh, for and sure. so yeah, so we've learned over the years, you know, what is too much, what isn't. Um, but at the to- at the beginning, it really was like trial and error. Let's mm-hmm, go mm-hmm. to this event, but maybe we have to leave early. Like, let's just be prepared that we might not be able to stay. You're a parent, um, but yeah, it's gone- clearly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think that's, yeah, I think that's the same for, for most parents. You have to test run different things with your kid because sure. not every kid is the same. Um, just for mine and other ones with autism, they can be a little bit more s- extreme reactions, like completely bolting from a place and you having to right. chase them so that you don't lose them. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so in terms of, of, talk to me about before your son was born, what was your mental connection to a dog? And now with your son... What is your connection to a, the, the, to be inside a dog? Um, so I was more of a cat person before, <laughs> and I still have cats. Yeah. Um, I always loved I always loved dogs, but I don't know. We just had cats at the house. Mm-hmm. I, my mom always said they were easier to take care of. So <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm gonna say for both cats and dogs, just. It's this connection of they don't judge you. Well, cats sometimes judge you. <laughs> they're they very judgy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? But they don't judge you in the sense that they're going to talk back to you or tell you that you're stupid or mm. things like that. Cats might judge you like you are petting me wrong, but right. they're not going to judge you on a personal level. Um and same with dogs. They just, they're excited to see you no matter what. If you've left the room for five minutes, they're they are like, you've been gone forever. I love yeah. you. I miss you. Um, 
So it gives you that dopamine rush. Let me back to that whole dopamine thing. Yep. Um, and, and they're just so calming, especially like brushing them. It's just quiet, calming, being in the moment, not mm-hmm. thinking about what's going to happen. All, all of the things that we've talked about kind of wrapped up in just a fun, furry package. <laughs> No, I hear you. I mean, look, you know, in my house, we have lots of animals um, as well. Uh, so you're, you're speaking to a kindred spirit. What, as a, as a parent who relies on, because he's 16, right now, your yes. son? Yep. So, so now as a parent, like he's, you know, he's essentially, he's about to, if you're looking at stages and, and you know, life stages, the next decade for for him, I mean, for his brain, any human brain really is going to yeah. say from say sixteen to say twenty seven, the brain really kind of does some serious baking in that skull. Um, yeah. So so how do you uh, anticipate or see supporting you know in, in in terms of your family with the dogs and all that? Like how do you how do you design that? How what do you foresee? <laughs> We take it one day at a time. And I say that because things can change very quickly. Mm-hmm. And when he was younger, I was like, oh, my gosh, he's never going to get his license. Like, I cannot picture him ever driving a car. He has his his beginner's license now. Oh, wow. And so, yeah. And so things can change very quickly or, or slowly. But I think it's just that hard work and dedication to trying different things until you find what works. Mm-hmm. And he he wants to do those things. Like he, he's been talking about now wanting to find a part-time job. Okay. And in my head, I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, that's fine. But remember that you have to talk to people nicely and like your boss can tell you what to do <laughs> and you, you can't just leave when you're feeling overwhelmed, <laughs> right? Like in my head, I'm thinking of all of the things that could go wrong. Right, right. And I have to catch myself and think, okay, you know what? Even if the first job doesn't work out and he gets fired, so what? It's an experience. Who cares? Right? Like it's not really actually a big deal. But my first reaction when he was saying that was, oh, my goodness, we have so much work to do because you're not going to be able to hold a job. He doesn't have to hold the first job. Mm -hmm. He just needs to have an experience of it. That's all. And so it's a mindset change as a parent to think like that. Yep. Um. And just being there for what he needs. So he he just finished his speech therapy. Actually, speech okay. therapist said he's done amazing. Um, and he definitely has. I can tell that he has slowed down in his speech. He's articulating better. It's fantastic. Um, he still goes to his other therapist and occupational therapy and stuff. So, you know, he he has a lot of things going on to help him. So in, in 10 years, I'm hoping – hoping he'll Mm -hmm. have moved out by then um he should have his full license by then hopefully he has figured out his career path um he's talked about maybe wanting to be a tattoo artist i'm like hey that's really cool because he loves doing art in fact he's he's designed two of my tattoos oh nice Um, yeah so yeah just just hoping that he's just like any of the other kids out there just maybe we need to do more work Has that side of your life made it into a book? It has. So um, it was actually the second book that I ever published. I think it was published back in 2018. Um, And it's called A Mother's Truth. Yeah. And it was basically from being pregnant up until I think halfway through grade six. Oh, wow. And I like to say we're writing part two right now because we're living it. And I've actually been... I'm, I've been bad. At the beginning, I was really good about taking notes because it's hard to think back on situations. Yeah. So I was trying to take notes as life went. I've kind of slacked off. But I am going to write a part two. He graduates next year from high school. So after that, then a part two will come up for the teenage years, the high school years. Wow. He actually designed the cover. Of? Of that A Mother's Truth. He designed the cover of that one. Nice. Nice. Um, Randy Lee, next photo, shall we? Yes. Great. Wait, didn't we do all three? Or is there uh, one? There are four photos. Oh, four. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Oh, this one's called Babies. Oh, oh yes. Okay, that's my baby. <laughs> okay, so this photo is... There are two people sitting on, this, on, the, on the sidewalk. 
This could only be in in Canada because the the lawn is nice and on the on the sort of the the two people seated, but around them you could just see this nice grass, June grass maybe July grass. Yep. Uh, and there's uh, some dandelions, so it's a little bit of yellow splashes here and there. In the background, there's somebody set up a table with uh, a speaker and maybe a mixing table. Uh, it's kind of peculiar. The two people standing. At a, at a lap, laptop, maybe they're mixing tunes, hard to tell. Two people are seated on the ground. There's a young boy, I don't know how old he would be, probably maybe about four three. or five? Three? Okay, three. Three. Okay, and seated next to the boy is, uh, is I don't know who that is. That's, who would that, that be? That would be my kid. My okay, 16-year-old. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay, okay, okay. Nice. So that is my 16-year-old and my grandson. Okay. Um, so oh. it was June. It might have even been May, actually. Um, okay. But it's a recent photo, and we're at a vendor event. So that's why the table, and they were playing music, uh, and it was okay, different okay, tables okay, okay. set up. Um, but uh, Adrian, my grandson, he wanted to sit down and play with his his Mr. Potato Head that he had bought. And so Lev went and sat with him so that me and okay. my mom could kind of look at some of more of the other things. That's great. So here's, hmm, okay, I'm going to let you explain why, why do you want to use this photograph? And I'm making connections that I, that I want to jump into right away, but I'm going to let you t- take the ball. Um, so I love this picture. It's just, it's very sweet of them. And it was, I mean, it's a nice picture, but they mean the world to me, right? Yep. So Adrian, my grandson, he is... I always, call, I always tell him, like, you're the light of my life. Grammy just loves you. And Aww. he's just so sweet. He, he actually says sometimes, he'll go, Grandpa, I don't love you. And we're like, why? He goes, because I love Grammy. <laughs> we're like, can't you love both of us? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> right? Every so often he'll be like, yeah, I love you, Grandpa. But really, it's he's always, I love you, Grammy. I miss nice. you, Grammy. And so he just... I love, I adore him. Um, And then my 16 year old, he's just in that picture. He's being so responsible to looking out for his nephew. And they love, they love hanging out together. Sometimes when Adrian comes over, he'll be like, uncle Levin, I want to play in your room. And so they'll go off and, and play in Lev's room. Nice. um, Watch movies and stuff. So it's, they're just so sweet together. And again, it's all that togetherness and family and fun. Clearly important values for you. Uh, yeah. Okay, so what, where I was going to jump into with this sort of thing is, okay, so there's, there's, I was listening to this podcast, uh, I don't remember his name, uh, he's a neuroscientist, and yeah. Mr. Potato Head, right? So there's this, this idea of, there's this uh, hypothesis uh, or theory about how, what our brains are like. And our brains are basically these things that are really good at having sensory inputs plugged into them, right? So for example, our fingers send back like signals that our brains go, okay, that's touch, got it. And our eyes send back signals that our brain go, oh, okay, that's that's like visual stimulus, got it. But you can create machines now that send back electrical signals. So for example, if, if somebody's like uh, amputated, that the brain gets these electrical signals to say, oh, okay, well, this... This thing that isn't as a machine, it's sort of like a brain is just an amazing thing for converting signals into sensory information, right? And so it's this, the theory is like the Mr. Potato Head theory of, of, of brains. So how would you connect that in terms of your experience of dealing, of growing, of writing, of, of thinking about the world? and converting sensory information as a Mr. Potato Head theory of, of, of thinking or of, of sensory, and then in terms of what you can connect with your son or your grandson or your own life. Yeah, so I think particularly because I write a lot of nonfiction, all of that sensory input that I've experienced goes into my writing. So mm-hmm. a lot of the sensory input into this last book that we talked about goodbye too soon. There was a lot of sadness, a lot of anger, a lot of grief, a lot of guilt. And that is a lot of emotions. And 
you know, seeing my brother, you know, before he died and then seeing him in the casket, um, oh, it was wow. very difficult. And so to bring that all back up afterwards, I think because my brain had been through therapy to help me make sense of all of these various sensory inputs from previous incidents in my life, mm -hmm. it, my brain was at a place that it was able to then cope with what was happening and put it in a manageable manner. Yeah. Whereas when, when bad things first happened, so, um, I've shared this before, so this is not new. Um, but my stepfather was an alcoholic and very emotionally, verbally abusive. So at mm -hmm. the time when those things were happening, when I was a teenager, my brain didn't know how how to wire that sensory input, yeah. how to wire the what I was hearing, what I was seeing, what I was feeling. Like they didn't know how to wire all of that. So I had to work through and I guess untangle. Mm -hmm. um, you know, take all the potato head pieces and put them back where they're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And now when those traumatic experiences happen, my potato head isn't falling apart. It might take a little bit of tape to push it all back together, but mm. it's able to then, you know, figure it out. Um, and to bring that back to my kid and my grandson, I think for my son anyways, it's a really big deal because so much of what I've had to learn with him is things that I never knew before. Yeah, of course. <laughs> right? And I mean, just as being a parent, I never really knew, but also the autism and different coping strategies and things like that I've had to learn. And then becoming a grandma so very young, mm -hmm. I was like blindsided and had to figure out how to do that. Yeah. Um, And so the brain, like you said, it's an amazing thing and it can really help us. Or it can really hurt us. Sure. Yeah. So you're a grandmother and you say really young. I mean, you're really young to be a grandmother. I mean, uh, full on. I was a grandma at 32. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> uh, and, but you look like you're in your early 20s. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. No, but it's and, – and so, okay. So in the same way that life – you know, you're, you really love cats. And then all of a sudden, you, you've started to – you needed to learn how to be a dog person mm -hmm. and understand the dog brain. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Can you describe, because in a, it, like putting a book out into the world is, is an act of stimulus and response. Like you're, in a way, you want to stimulate other brains out there to kind of go through the words and then respond in a way that for them – elevates or makes their lives easier or whatever so can you mention like even though your book's only been out for a month has there been a kind of a signal from the world to say to you okay you kind of hit a nerve yes so i've had a few people read it and um, give reviews and um, actually my editor when she read it first she was like i had to have tissues it was so sad um and then others as they've read it after it's now come out have said it, it it was very emotional very touching and people that have known my brother have read it and said oh my goodness you you hit the nail on the head with this um because it it is about brandon but it is also about family members because it's from my perspective so family members of somebody with an addiction and mm -hmm. how that person is first and foremost a person even yeah, though we have had difficulties with them. Um, but, you know, in the media and in society, a lot of times we don't we don't realize that they're a person. We don't realize that they have family members who miss them and love them. Mm -hmm. um, and then I go into a little bit of research, risk factors of developing it and the DSM-5 and, and things like that. So it was actually funny. My brother's ex-girlfriend, who they stayed friends with, um, she's the mom of two of his kids. And her mom had never liked Brandon, really, mm -hmm. really disliked him. Yeah. Um, but even she said that sh the book made her emotional. And so yeah. when when my brother's ex had told me that, she goes, you know how much my mom didn't like him? And even she was emotional. She said it was good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, that, that actually means something to me because, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that she read it alone meant something. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So is it, because this is territory that I'm you know, looking at it now in now uh so in terms of his addiction 
And in terms of the stigma and the, 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 the difficulties around that, like, what would you like is, is talking about his like what his addiction was focused around be it alcohol or drugs or whatever it is like drugs. do you f- okay so drugs so do you feel that that's an important part of his story or important part of your story or what is the important part of the story um i think the most important part of the story is that realizing we realizing that people with an addiction like i said are first and foremost people and as the family member realizing that It's really okay if you have to take a step back and put Mm -hmm. boundaries in place. That is the main message of that book. Um, But I do think that it's important to recognize that there are different types of addictions that affect people differently. Um, Because say a, a shopping addiction, it exists, but the likelihood of it killing you is much lower than an addiction to drugs. Mm -hmm. It can affect your life greatly. You can go into severe debt. You can lose relationships. You can be divorced, things like that. But the likelihood of of death Mm -hmm. is much lower. Right. Um, It doesn't mean that that addiction is, you know, worse or better or whatever. It's it's different. And I think that's what's important. And so for Brandon, um, his addiction was drugs. He did drink, but the the addiction was really more the drugs. Um, Mm Mm-hmm. And understanding when you're doing drugs, especially right now where I am, fentanyl is a massive killer. Right. Um, And realizing that drugs are now laced with things that you don't know what they are. Sure. Sure. Hua. Okay. Brandy Lee. <clears throat> hmm. <laughs> Vacation. Together. Babies and your book. So the title of your book again is Gone Too Soon. Goodbye Too Soon. Goodbye Too Soon. Really great to talk to you. Uh, any last bit? Okay, so w- people who are going through it are going to feel alone or going to feel isolated. Uh, maybe, not potentially. <clears throat> so what can you give a listener as a kind of a, a kind of a, from the previous guest, a nugget of hope? Like what can you give a person as a nugget of hope to kind of inspire them beyond getting your book to get through the day? So you're not alone, first off, obviously, because you've now listened to this episode and you know that. And you don't have to feel bad for choosing yourself. Mm. It is not selfish to do so. It is potentially a way to save yourself much heartache and potentially save yourself from a disaster. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not to say that you don't love that person, but choosing yourself is very important. This is why on airplanes, they tell you to put your oxygen mask on first before you help somebody else. 100%. So I think that is the biggest nugget of hope. You're not alone and you can choose yourself. Brandy Lee Boslaw. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me again. You're such a bright star, bright light. Oh, so great. Thanks. Okay. Well, enjoy your... Look, you know what? Since a holiday and a vacation is just a mindset, may you forever be on vacation. I grant you this. I love it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye. Bye. Shooting it raw? Yes. Shooting it raw.